In this demonstration, I'm going to show you how we can take a model like this console table in SketchUp, bring this over to Fusion 360, import it, and then model a beautiful curved organic shape for the wall detail behind it, which is something that SketchUp natively is not possible. We're going to use actually the import and export SketchUp format for this. Yeah, and then we bring everything back to SketchUp so we can compose our scene, add actually all the missing elements, add materials, the floor, the metal handle to it, and then we export everything as OBJ, bring this to Blender and render engine so we can create beautiful photorealistic renderings like this. Okay, pretty easy, no? Yeah, so let's do it. So here is a SketchUp file, as you can see on my desktop. This one I would like to import, upload into Fusion 360. To do this, we can just go to File, Upload, or we go to here, Upload. Go select, select the file, open, specify the location where you would like this to go to and click Upload. It will then show up inside your dashboard. You see here there's an upload progress. So one version is currently being uploaded. Once this is done, it tells you complete and the file will show up. So here is a file that's already finished. I can double click it, close that dashboard. Yeah, and there we are. So this is exactly the way how the file was created in SketchUp. The unit system is correct. If I go and measure this, for example, from there to there, 14 inches. Yeah, perfect. That's exactly the way how it should be. Now in this model, I built everything from the world center to the right and to the back. Our outcome is going to be a floor with a back and then a wavy part over the wall. So I might actually want to select this and move this to the front. Can line this up with kind of like this corner there or yeah, okay, very good. Whoops. So let's say plus minus there. Thank you. And now I know when here along the Z axis is the wall, I will have a baseboard half of an inch and another half of an inch for the trim to kind of like hide the gap between baseboard and hardwood floor. Okay, so I moved this over minus one inch. Okay, to maybe help this visualize a little bit, I'm going to make a sketch. Here's a sketch, a line that is actually 16 inches uh, horizontally and a line that is 80 inches vertical. Okay, and then when I zoom in here, I could continue drawing a line up over, press D and say this should be 0 0.5 of an inch, and then this should be four inches. That's the baseboard. Thank you. Then I need to have also a circle from here. I make the circle one inch because then I can use the trim tool and cut all the other stuff away. Look at that, D, click that half an inch. There's my um, half inch round trim. So this basically now can work as a framework where later nah, the wall plus minus would be. Okay, from the front, now it makes sense to select our furniture piece and then move this over. Um, can we actually measure the distance? 
So from there, this corner point to maybe this um, should be probably 34 as it looks. So 34 divided by two, uh, 15, so 17, okay, very good. You move minus 17 inches. Oh, <laughs> I just moved actually just the body. One, one. Let's select the whole group and move this whole component minus 17 inches there. Okay, perfect. So it's very good centered. Everything we're going to do in Fusion again is just to model actually this backdrop because the rest we can do easily in SketchUp. It might help, however, to draw now in this view another rectangle. So here's a rectangle from the center point. I'm going to draw this kind of super crazy on purpose to show you how we can straighten everything quite easily. There we are. Then equal constraint for the two lines on the bottom. Then we press D. This should be AD and then this line should be 100. This is kind of like the studio space we're going to work in. Okay. Sketch one, we don't really need any more. It's not really that important. Okay, so now comes the fun part. Let's go to mesh, nope, form, and go to plane. Here we click on this piece. There's our, our wall. We want to create this wavy construction on it. We can click on this point here, click and then drag this out. So left and right, that's maybe 100 inches. And then if we go to here, this is 80 inches. Now here we need to keep in mind, now we have a four inch baseboard. So this cannot be 80 inches. But if I type in 100, let's see, uh, 100. Uh, yeah, okay, I press escape one more time because I wasn't really able to punch in the numbers there 100 tab 80 minus 4 76 enter and click okay cool so i already measured these things out that's the reason why i know the numbers here plus minus six vertical cuts are good and then for the horizontal cuts we will need 16. Click OK. Good. Now, when I click this point and this point, what's the distance? 8 inches. OK, so if I double click um, this whole thing, or if I go to move, sorry, and then say body, this whole body minus 8 inches down. I love it when it doesn't do it when I want. There, minus eight inches. Thank you. There you see the top part lines up. At the bottom, that is where no, the base board would be. You see, there, lines up. Easy peasy math. Okay, so what can we do now with this funny T-spline thing? Why did I create all these individual segments here? So... I will go to Modify and Edge, and then I double click, double click, double click, and I'm holding the Shift key too. There we are. You see actually how I have start, blue, black, blue, black, blue, blue, start. That's the reason why 16 subdivisions. And I'm going to move this forward. Wow, look at this. It's a nice wavy form. I'm going to crease these edges. Now we have really nice sharp edges. Go to modify, double click, hold shift, double click, because these lines are way too, well, I mean, they're cutting into our furniture piece. That's kind of dumb. So maybe like this. I can select actually these um, lines in between, but not this top and bottom line. 
and push this a little bit closer to the wall. Okay, very nice. Cool. No, not too bad. And if we want things to visualize a little bit easier, maybe here I turn on this uh, sketch, go to solid, extrude, select this and this with shift. And then I say extrude symmetry to a total of 100 inches. So now I can see this more as kind of like in relationship. No? Okay, very nice. I hope I will. I hope or I think this actually really uh, explains this well. So what can I do now? Let's go back to form. The fun stuff happens. Maybe this edge and this edge. I scale apart. And maybe this edge and this edge, I scale towards each other. Okay, maybe this edge and this edge. No, to do the opposite. Uh, come on. I scale apart. And then this edge and this edge, I scale towards each other. Look how beautiful this actually looks. I, I can create really nice fluid shapes. I'm just alternating it. Uh, sometimes the selection tool and the scale tool get into each other's way. Uh, so scale up. Yeah, I guess. Wait. Uh, no. Wah, wah. <laughs> the opposite way. Here and here and there. Cool. Yeah, you see it, then we can create these really nice intricate elements, some more creative ideas. Maybe one element now I move further. So uh, it sticks out more. Or undo it, maybe I select here just a few elements in the center, move it out. And it creates a really nice smooth transition. You have to be careful what view you're in and what arrow you also click on, just so you know. We can also select an edge and rotate it. Well, that works too. We can also go to point select and just only move individual points if we want to. I find actually with here, the beauty is in simplicity, clarity. I shouldn't really say simplicity, but more clarity and consistency. So what we have here, this is really what I only want to have. Okay, so this is good. So this uh, wall, and uh, not wall, the baseboard piece, I remove the, these sketches I don't need anymore. Very good. This I can hide and this piece is kind of done now. So I can now right click while in form mode onto this piece, go convert and convert it from T splines to B wrap. B wrap, uh, B -wrap is a NURBS surface. Click OK. There we are. Yeah, looks pretty cool, no? This body, I can still know if I want to modify here just to show you what I'm doing. I'm just pushing one piece out and then right click and say convert. Same thing. No, I made another version. The first one I actually liked the most. So I'm going to undo, undo, undo till I'm back to where I was before. Alternatively, I can also select this T-spline body, go to modify and move, copy, make a copy and just maybe, I don't know, move it 150 over and then this I can modify and then I make maybe make another copy and all these copies I always move 150, uh, 150 inches. So I know how to maybe line them up later in SketchUp. Just a little trick. Okay, beautiful. So 
how do we bring this back into SketchUp? That's actually pretty easy. Um, I need to make sure that now nah, here, nothing touches, it doesn't, that's very good. I can now also save, so the design is saved, go to export and then say, well, save as SketchUp, red table with wall, click export. It takes a moment and basically now it converts everything what we see here into a SketchUp file and then saves it on the desktop. So everything is actually finished exporting. I will get a notification. There we have this there, show in the finder. So there it is. Um, this is my original console table. This is now the SketchUp file, including the red wall. So what I will or can do, I will open this file. This is an older SketchUp version. Yeah, so click OK. And there we are. So this wall I really want. I double click make group. So it's fused. And as a preparation for the scene rendering, I go to a side view. And then I will here start from this center point. There we are, draw a line up four inches, draw a line horizontal, half of an inch, draw a line down and back. There we are. And then this I will extrude till that one corner. So that's the baseboard. And then this face I extrude to there. Easy peasy. Triple click everything, make group. There we are. Wait, undo, triple click, really make group. And then it's time to create this quarter piece. So here I draw a line, half an inch escape, draw a line up, half an inch escape. And I will use the, yeah, this one. So uh, from the center rotation to here, draw myself an arc to there, there we are. And then this 100 inches and triple click make group. There we are. Cool. Okie dokie. So kind of like the baseboard is done and the wall is done. We can maybe do the ground. So I will select the line tool from here. Then I draw a line 60 inches and escape, zoom out a little bit from here along the X axis, 100 inches. I, if everything is done correctly, I can snap to there and then snap to this corner. And there we are. There's our ground, triple click and make group. Cool. Okay. So now, there is actually now our newly built environment with this beautiful curved background. So before we continue creating materials in SketchUp, I'm going to show you a photo of actually this furniture piece. And you see here, there's a wood floor, there is the red console table, some birds, the wall, kind of like the way how this was photographed. The reason why I show you this piece is I find that people who are trying to learn how to render for the first time really struggle understanding what they have to do to make a rendering look good because it can be a little bit confusing or not very logical. We have dials to move and what they all mean, who knows? And we can experiment, maybe have a lucky hit, or we experiment when and we have disasters and hours of time is wasted. So I think if I'm really quite honest, the most logical and productive approach is photograph what you would like to rebuild, study where's the light coming from, what are the shadows, what are the colors, what are the reflections, 
and then simply take realistic photos as a reference to rebuild your digital version because you have a reference. And I think this is not necessarily cheating. It is simply teaching you how we have to fine tune our renderings to look visually or yeah, believable. Okay, very good. So I have here a few more photos too. This is, for example, photographed from this angle. What is very interesting is you see what is reflective and how, for example, the birds are reflected. It's not very clear, so it means that surface is a little bit blurry. If I go in more, well, this is also very good. You can see how also the color can change based on yeah, the, um, the white tone the camera app selects. But you we can see here now there's a structure on that surface. From the distance, we weren't really able to see it. From here, we are able to see it. So this is very important when we want to recreate materials digitally in rendering. Well, we need to know how they really look in real life. I actually moved the camera down to look more nearly tangent, um, parallel to that surface. And look, that reflection is so much cleaner. Here, it's kind of blurry no so and also this reflects more of the wall here it does less reflect the wall and there's even some wood grain going on and look at the gaps between the frame and the drawer fronts and here again like different views uh, ignore the issue of the color difference but what's really interesting is here we don't really see much and then there we can see it looks like there's some sort of a cloudy structure on that face and thanks to the birds there are a lot of scratches on the surface look at this metal part now not really take a photo from really far but this is a really good exercise to go in and take detailed photos and then look at this and study it. How does this look? Because this is what we want to later render and show. What's the reflection? So this is like a metal with some sort of a glossy film over it, giving this nice reflection on top. Here, another nice corner look. The highlight, these really thin lines, and then this highlight and the structure we see on it. Or here, how this is kind of round and not really super sharp. The gap. Also a really good uh, technique is when doing these photographs, do these photographs with a ruler so we can establish scale because in any 3D texturing rendering program, we can then create something that represents a scale maybe like a three inch rectangle, and then we put a texture on it, and then we can use uh, what we do inside the software and compare it to the way how this looks in real life, like in this photo. Now here again, just a photo and such. Okay, now, so you saw I had there actually lots of studies for the metal. So for example, I was then looking for a texture scratched metal that maybe to a certain degree start started to look similar to it. And then here also I have a wooden floor. This is slightly different than in this reference, but it will it will work for what we're trying to do. Okay, very good. So in SketchUp, let's go to materials. And there we are, colors in model. And this is properly here, this grayscale object. Again, double click, select this. And maybe here on the macOS, I changed this maybe to something really black, just so you see what's going on. It's not we're going to use black, but you see now here we have this black material. Okay, very good. Technically speaking, this would be white, but then you see a white preview on a white uh, yeah, interface. It's hard to see. That's the main reason for it. So let's go to here. I right? double click. 
um, and also here, maybe I just go to a nice gray color. There we are. And then I will do the same also here for this baseboard and this trim there. Um, this material, I can add it. Um, then, for example, I call this baseboard. Thank you. And actually this material, right click, add it. And then here I say wall. So I know actually later we are the names. What is it really we are seeing here? Good. Okay. Well, then maybe go to the ground, which is easy. So right click new texture, go to desktop. There is my wood floor. There we are. Thank you. I really don't know the dimension yet. So I'll just keep this at the moment. Then double click my geometry so I can select the faces and then drag this one in. Cool. Then I click somewhere else. So I'm out. Actually, it doesn't look too bad. Right click edit. And then here I can still go ahead and say, well, maybe this should be 26 inches tab. And you see how this adjusts the scaling. Now maybe 35 inches is actually quite good. Perfect. So it's not too big, it's not too small, is believable. Okay, good. Wood floor, the name is fine. Then we have here this group and all these um, yeah, groups inside. So I can double click and double click and select everything. And then I would like this to be a new, maybe this violet red color. Maybe more like this, there we are, and paint it there. Very good. Right click, edit, and we can say red paint. Very nice. The legs all have the same material. So there we are. The drawer faces have the same material. And there we are. Very good. But then these handles now, whoop. Oh, hello there. I forgot you. There we are. And these drawer handles, they have a different material. So new texture and metal scratches. There we are. Metal scratched. We could call this metal scratched or metal handle, drawer handle. It's really up to you to define. There we are. Zoom in, drag this in. Whoa, <laughs> this is way too big for both kind of. Okay. Uh, click somewhere outside. So we're leaving the, the group edit. So both of these objects have it. And now I can right click and say edit and say, yeah, I mean, that maybe should be four inches with, ah, look at that. This looks now much more believable. No? Okay. Very good. Okay. So we kind of like actually created kind of like, um, I would say material placeholders for this scene. So some sort of color for the furniture, material for the handles, stuff for the baseboard and the trim, the floor and the wall. This is now something actually then we can export and then load into your render program. And then in that render program, we are refining the materials. Now we want to bring everything over to Blender or any render program. So we go to export 3D model. Then we will select OBJ options. 
And for the model units, we want to select meters. Blender, for example, works with meter as the base unit system. So swap Y and Z, we want to turn off, export texture maps, that's perfect. Click OK. I will select the desktop for this to be exported. So everything what we see here right now will be exported as one file to the desktop. Click export, there we are. That was pretty fast. So there we are. Now there's actually our geometry here. Easy peasy. Okay, so cool. Let's bring this over to there and I'm going to start Blender. There we are. So I will press A to delete everything. And then the unit system is set to metric, which is good. I will go File, Import, Wavefront, OBJ, click Desktop. Here is my my uh, OBJ file. I will switch forward to Y, Z up, and then split by group. So everything will be separated. Uh, keep in mind, like in SketchUp, we have groups and or bodies and fusion, and kind of like Blender has more or less the same. So instead of just being one piece, it will be separated into individual objects import and there we are you see now here is our collection with all the different objects if i zoom in there is everything you see i can click all these individual objects really cool so transfer it over perfectly now since we're in the us we might like to work more with the imperial system okay so let's go to unit system and set this then to inches i click this object press n and look at that this is 100 inches wide 76 inches tall so also there scale wise one to one it perfectly transfers so that's actually how easy it is then to bring an object from sketchup or a scene over to a different render program, in this case, Blender. And the other very nice aspect of this process is, while now so far I talked about moving geometry between different programs, let's click on this viewport shading. <laughs> Look at that. Even the texture from SketchUp carries over. So this is actually really nice. Even here and there we have the metal part. So I can also press Z and then go solid or Z and material preview. There we are. Cool. So now we are ready to continue setting up our environment to create a beautiful rendering. Let's start with the backdrop. Right click and say shade smooth. And yeah, we get something like this. Right click, shade smooth auto. Hmm not really very good what i want is actually these hard edges that shouldn't be soft rendered they should be sharp an easy trick here is to go to modifiers where we're modifying the geometry and say edge split there we are we get something that's slightly better and then if we click and move our mouse to the left there so at 22 degrees we get um the the angle ra ratio where all the curved surfaces are shaded smooth and these sharp corners are well as you can see sharp cool by the way for those who are curious if we now go to edit mode and you see here we have polygons too so this is similar to kind of like what we had in T-splines and pretty much the same also what we have actually in SketchUp because SketchUp is a polygon modeler. So when I select this box and go into edit mode, there you see, you know, there are all the individual faces and I can go to face select, select these two faces, go to move, move this up, 
Now it's pretty much really the same, just different interfaces. It's also very important to understand that these programs share a lot of similarities, just interface is different. Okay, so our backdrop is good. Before we really focus on the materials, we have to create a nice environment. So let's go to add and then we go to camera. Where's the camera? It's there. Move the camera back, move the camera up. I would like to rotate the camera, zero tap, zero tap, zero, enter. And then along the X axis, we just move this one up, maybe there. This border I move up. I go to this border, right click, split vertical. And then in this border, I press N and T and uh, click on the camera icon. There we are. So now I can on the left side see the camera and on the right side, I can move around. Cool, no? Very nice. This is actually a landscape photo. So maybe we would like to change the format of this image. So let's go to the output format. Instead of 2000 by 1000, let's set this to 1000 by 2000 pixels. Okay, or maybe uh, 1500. You see how the camera ratio updates. So maybe I put the camera kind of like to here and um, I can click on the X and then press R for rotate and rotate the camera down a little bit. Maybe like this. So I'm looking slightly down. Very good. Okay, cool. Then let's go to, since we're work setting things up here, we go to the world setting. The world, we make white, but for the strength, we make this zero. This means there's white light, but no energy. So this is going to be a pitch black environment. And then we go to here and switch this to cycles. So the render engine, we switch to cycles, which is a photorealistic render engine. And don't forget to save. I call this console table rendering. Very nice. Cool. Z and rendered. Okay, now you see it's pitch black, nothing is happening. So let's actually add a light. Okay, so in this view, I go add light area. I move this one up. Oh, look at that. That's pretty cool. I already see that how the light comes down and then illuminates everything. Maybe I can move this light a little bit forward. Pretty cool. Not too bad. Okay. So this light, I would like to adjust in terms of the proportion. So I go to the light button. There we are. Switch this from simply square to a rectangular format. And then I have to see which one is it. So this is maybe 12 inches and then this maybe six feet. There, better. Cool. This is the y-axis. So along the y-axis, I can rotate this minus 90 degrees, go to a front view, move this down, go to a top view, move this back. I can go to rotate and then click on this blue piece and rotate it. Okay, very nice. Click somewhere else. Yeah, looks not too bad. Click this one. Shift D, make a copy, move this to here, click, and then I click on the blue arrow and rotate it too. Maybe this one I go a little bit to the side more and then move this to here. Okay, you see here, this is our 
camera frame and everything inside the frame we will see everything outside we don't really see so we're dealing here with lights right now we can specify the lights maybe this is weaker zero watts uh, it's zero actually really only forget just there's a watt behind it just punch in numbers and then see what happens now 100 is huge now if i go this is like a supernova i find this very often is much easier to understand 20 watts stronger so 20 a lot of lights coming in click this one 10 yeah okay cool there will be a lot of going forward and backwards so we're not really going to fine-tune everything too much from the beginning okay so we have now a little bit of light inside our scene we see drop shadows cast onto the walls that's quite nice now we can talk about refining actually the material at this point let's click the wall that's the easiest one first we also set this to shader editor uh, scroll wheel zoom in middle mouse button adjust then i go to the material view scroll down with the mouse wheel and we can say well this is just a flat um, surface no specular reflection so it's not reflective it has no roughness it's just pure purely matte if i click on this maybe we make this white well technically speaking this should be 80 percent there's no pure white or pure black in computer graphics in the real world so i don't go pure white or don't go pure black so somewhere there 0.8 cool okay then i can select maybe a body that has this magenta looking material I can see the same material here and here so it doesn't really matter where maybe i would like to edit it the node editor is or shader editor is a very powerful tool to adjust how something works and it shows you the flow chart better so i will zoom in here a little bit uh, and maybe here z and turn this off here z and do the rendering so i can see more how this actually works so now i click on this material very nice uh this is way too magenta so maybe let's tone this down figure out a good value we would like to have again this is where working with reference photos is very good so this is actually getting closer to the color of the actual piece i showed you very nice we have specularity and roughness uh, let's turn this down specularity makes this glossy 0.5 is actually good for kind of like plastic 0 0.25 0 0.1 you see it gets lower and lower 0.01 and then roughness that makes the reflection kind of blurry if it's no roughness it's very sharp kind of like polished if we go to one well it's super sandblasted again here what value do you use or to use well just study photograph existing objects materials and then compare I find this is the easiest way to figure out what to do. Very good. So 0 0.01. And just one, just a little bit of shimmer there. 0 0.3. Yeah, this is maybe okay. For the first look. Cool. Okay. Then here I press Z and solid. I will select the word and look at this there's actually what is considered an image texture so this image texture has the wood floor and it's going into the wood color so if i disconnect this z and rendered yeah you see there is no texture 
if I go to there, there's the texture. Everything that I'm going to show you here is also true for literally every professional program today. They all work with nodes and the, the way how shaders work, the building blocks are always the same. We deal with color, we deal with reflection or metallic. Now this is not metal, but plastic. We deal with roughness. So there's maybe a little bit of, of roughness to the ground. There's a little bit of reflectivity. And right now, if we take a look at this floor, uh, this looks very vinyl, like a print, now because it's too artificial. What's missing are all these grooves and cuts and uh, crevice uh, details that make us feel like, yeah, this is actually a wood floor. So check this out. Moving this up a little bit. I go to add and vector and bump. So bump is a tool in every program that talks about a depression or something that is raised. It's a trick because we, it renders highlights or shadows and that gives us the illusion of a structure. So I put the bump to there and then the color goes into the height and then the normal, so the surface orientation goes into the normal here. And yeah, you see now already, it looks like there's a wood grain. So let's lower the height a little bit more. There, look at that. Oh, it looks like real wood. No, this image is converted into a grayscale image and then is adjusting the highlights. So the specularity, if I set this to zero, now there you can see this. If I set this to zero, clean, 0.1, a little bit, 0.2. Now this is still too artificial, 0.5 or one. Now that starts to look much, much better. Cool, the distance is kind of like, Think about this vertically, you have a valley and um, the tip of a hill. So this is what the distance means. If I set this to one, it is really extreme. So the result is high. If I flatten this, the result is less extreme. Again, there are no mathematical values what you have to put in here. This comes really from studying your environment, memorizing it, and then understanding how do you have to render something so it looks correct. I click on the camera here for the moment and look at the ground, zoom in there. Yeah. I can see here in the shadow, there is some sort of grain going on. That looks pretty good without this. It looks terrible. Cool, job done. Okay, for the wood floor. Okay. We can select the metal part here. So this should be metal, for example. So metal is metallic. So we turn metallic on. Roughness, I put down. Z and rendered. So you see like we get a really nice crazy reflection on it. And then here I do this crazy thing and put this into the roughness. And now this image that is this metal handle will adjust how, mm, let me maybe get to a better view, turn this off. You see this uniform reflective and when I put this into roughness it has this image is being used to make some areas more rough or more smooth. I could also put this actually into specular to make some areas more specular or less or the metallic. The roughness here actually works really good because essentially in real life that's the way how it is. Some surfaces are nice and smooth, the reflection is clean, some areas are more scratched, sandblasted, the reflection is not as smooth. Okay, very good. Now we can put this back, there we are. And um, 
yeah so basically that's a very easy way how we can create a metallic look and now if this metal piece that we scratch with sandpaper or whatever and then we coated it with another layer of polyurethane okay let's add a clear coat just on top so now this clear coat is nice and smooth but under that clear coat we have this reflection that is kind of like brushed or so okay good now you start noticing yeah the scene actually starts to look quite believable again everything what i'm trying to do is based on studying the reality working with lights working with materials trying to rebuild them how reflective is a surface how scratched is a surface to increase our storytelling we might want to also add few props so in the download link there was also a bird file so we can go to file append desktop there are the uh, ems house birds by vitra double click objects bird append and there is that bird now we can move this bird up z and solid so i stop rendering bring this over this is kind of like too big so i'm going to scale this one down with s to be honest there bring this over go to this straight side view eyeball this a little bit top view r for rotating shift d make a copy and r rotate it yeah hello there clock 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 i'm hungry feed me breakfast i made your breakfast you didn't eat it that was the story with my daughter this morning anyway so now we can play with these things around also these objects have their individual materials now oh, they're there we else they have for example multiple materials so the black body the beak the eye and all the stuff z and render it oh, look at that now having few elements added makes the whole scene look more realistic there's more stuff happening so talking about realism if i zoom in you see here i have this uh, cavity or distance built in that's something i did on purpose because when i measured in the furniture piece i saw that there was a certain amount of distance now between the drawer and the opening but also with these edges here they are not super sharp like in this version so we need to round them this is not something we want to do in sketchup we can this do rather during render time so with this object selected you see i went to modifiers and then went to bevel bevel is for rounding and then I say maybe one millimeter and maybe 10. Oh, look at that. I look much better. I can maybe select the drawer, do the same bevel, one millimeter and 10. And select this one. I do the same bevel, one millimeter and 10 segments segments in uh, blender here are uh, pretty much the same like segments in well sketchup it's all the same segments it's all polygon meshes but now when i zoom in you can see there are more rounded um, details this really makes this design actually then look more believable not la not so computer generated I will select these two objects press shift h okay so in this file i have you can see this one drawer has actually multiple materials this one does not so i can select this object go to materials front color and i remove this one so now only this red paint is applied to the whole geometry 
Alt H and we are back. So the rendering actually will look better, much better. Cool. Okay. I pressed zero on the keypad or here you can click on the camera icon and then with Z and rendering. Yeah. No. Look at that. The two birds really start adding to the design. Alt H. There we're back. Cool. Okay. Now, the, maybe to bring this to an end, to make a nice rendering, we want to also have a light coming down. So to show you how the modeling between SketchUp, which is polygon-based, and Blender, or oh Maya, 3D Max, Cinema 4D, Lightwave, well, nobody uses Lightwave anymore, but it's all polygon-based, it's all the same. This might be a good exercise. So we have the 3D cursor down here, this uh, white, red, circular bullseye thing. If I go to add and say cylinder, there's a cylinder now. And I can go to here and say, so this cylinder should be 64 vertices. See, like in, in SketchUp, now this is making this more refined. If I type in 12, it's very coarse. 60 more radius so this should be a four inch light so two inches for the radius and 10 inch for the depth okay and then i can bring this one up bring this over there we are maybe bring this a little bit further up i'm not really taking care of or paying attention to the cable because in the rendering we don't even see it there now it's not visible okay cool now check this out we go to edit mode equal double click in sketchup to go into um, edit the group then i go with the face select select this face i press i for offset and then I move the mouse a little bit so I created a little bit of an offset and then I press E for extrude and move my mouse up and I do an extrusion cool huh? okay then object mode here comes the cool stuff now let's go to materials new material um, then here we can call this lab shell this could be white could be nicely reflective very good then we go to plus and then say lamp light thank you middle mouse button i'm going to show also here the uh, the node editor i go into edit mode i have this face selected and look there's an assign button so i click assign now this material lamp light is assigned to this geometry piece which i have selected there and then i go to here and say uh emission yeah be white thank you it's shooting out light now and if I go back and maybe play with this and say maybe emission 10 and edit mode, let's see, I select this light, press H, select this light, press H. Uh, so there is actually really light coming, but we can see it's well, way too weak. So maybe 100, the, okay, there. <laughs> uh 500 ah okay no so you see we actually build a light and out of this cone we're shooting light out again um emission strength watts lumen per square foot whatever just play with the numbers till it feels this is something you are actually shooting for now the emission uh, or lights have particular colors. So let's go to add converter and black body. And this black body we connect. Oh, look at this. This is really dark. So 
3500 Kelvin degrees. 5500 Kelvin degrees. Kind of like candlelight. 5000. No? D50 sunlight. Alt H. So now we see there we have actually the light coming uh, from this piece. It has a color. We can also select this light. Here we would like to adjust this light. So we click on use notes. Then I go to view frame selected. Then it zooms into the notes at converter uh, black body. There we are. And then we say 5000. So I don't really have to mix the color of a light by hand. I simply use the temperature to set this correctly. Very good. There. Now, so this is basically now shooting out the light, illuminating this area with not a pure white light, but more a nice warm light. This is more realistic. And we can see because the the cone, or the cylinder has actually these reflections on it, right click, shade, outer smooth, we get a nice plastic reflection. The inside is super illuminated because there the light is inside. And then there you can see it is illuminating everything onto the birds. Yeah, uh, creative play. We can move this up and down, play with this left. Uh, nah, I mean, it makes no sense to be outside. It should be more on there. The closer it's to the wall, the more obviously it shoots light onto the wall. We can maybe lower this effect a little bit. So here is the lamp light. There's the emission, 250, so 50%. Yeah, in the rendering then we can see that there is something happening. Yeah, that's kind of like the way how then we would set up materials and lights for our environment. The last step now is to create the actual rendering and saving it into an image. So we can go to the render properties. Okay, we can go to denoise 100 for the preview mode while we render we can set this also to 20 and we can set this to 20 so that means when i z and render you see here 1 to 20 and then boom it's done you see this is grainy and when it's 20 flop it's all nice and clean so it doesn't render it till the grain is gone it renders in my case till 20 frames and then makes it well kind of like look okay um, the lower the frames the more blotchy and blurry it gets the more frames the more detailed it gets um, how do i know what samples to use this is experience 100 properly will be fine maybe 50 can be good maybe 200 we need who knows we have to actually do some experiments with it okay very good so then um, this is all set, Z and solid. Then we can go to the output. We render thousand by thousand pixels. 100% do we need a test render, 50%, 25%, 100. We can also specify where to save this to, the desktop as PNG with the alpha and red, green, blue channel. Yeah, that's kind of it. And then let's go hit render. And you see it's rendering. And it's done. Finished. Huh? Not too time consuming. Um, I have here again uh, just 100 samples and 50%. So when I set this to 100, I go to render view render and then I switch this to slot two. Okay, and do a rendering. 
mouse wheel, I can zoom in and out. So you see it takes a tick longer. There we see the numbers going up step by step. Yeah, moment, there we are, very good. And then we can compare now, small version, large version, view, um, frame all, this is actually fractionally up there. This is the one-to-one, -one. this is the scale version. Nope. And then we could go and say image, save as, desktop, and we just call this final rendering file format, click save, and that's it. Very good. Now oh, we created this beautiful rendering of this console table with some lights, with a nice curvy backdrop, a left right, a right light, a top light, and two birdies.